uh, I just thought you and I could kind of have a chat about um, the book, the process, our friendship, how we met, and and so on. So sure. I made some notes just in case, and I was thinking about, do you remember how we met? I mean, we met through um, people that, that, that we met through some guys who thought I should be helping you with your book, basically. Yeah, yeah. Rick and I were on the phone with a dear friend who was very interested in what we were writing. And it's so funny because I say the book and it really wasn't a book yet. It was becoming a book. Yeah, um, it, you, it was a book. It was a draft of a book. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, it, But either way, we had... had brought a few wonderful people kind of into our circle to bounce some ideas off of them. So Rick and I are on the phone one night with this gentleman or one afternoon. And he said, Hey, um, I've got a friend of mine. He's, he's an author. Um, and uh, his name is Brandon. And, and he might, I think he might be interested in knowing a little bit more about this book. And it's so interesting because months and months earlier, another gentleman who, I normally kind of refer to as our publicist. Um, he kept saying, we got to get you in front of Brandon Sanderson. And it just never seemed right to me. I mean, I, I know who Brandon Sanderson is. I will admit I'm not a, a, a fan of his in the sense that I really haven't read his books, but obviously I know who he is. I, so I remember telling this friend of mine, you know what? Brandon sounds right, but I don't think it's Brandon Sanderson. So when this other friend said, hey, I've got a friend, he's an author, and his name is Brandon, the moment he said Brandon, I went, oh, my goodness, this is the right Brandon. So then he gets you on the phone, and I realize it's Brandon Mole. Now, Brandon, you're probably one of the most humble people I've ever met in my life, and I've had the wonderful experience of attending two of your book signing tours and watching you interact with your fans uh, was so wonderful for me, especially seeing them, many of them coming with tear, tear filled eyes and just so excited to meet you. Um, but when I found out it was Brandon Mole, um, and I, then I did a little bit of homework. Well, first I mentioned it to a couple of my adult kids and they went, oh my gosh, Brandon Mole, Fable Haven. Then they started throwing out all these books of yours that they had read. And I hadn't really read fantasy fiction. It wasn't something that I was really interested in. But sure. as I started talking to some of my kids and doing some research, then I realized this isn't just uh, an author. Uh, this is one of the most well-known authors in the world in the genre of fantasy fiction. And uh, so I was pretty excited when I realized uh, who we were dealing with. But anyway, so we, we got on the phone, we got you on the phone. I don't really remember the details of the conversation, but you seemed interested in, and you said, hey, when can we get together? And I think it was like the next day or a couple days later, my wife, Sean, and I met you and Erlin for dinner, I think. And, and it was so cool because the moment I saw both you and Erlin, I knew that uh, this would be a special relationship and friendship. And, and Brandon, it truly has been. Um, and I'm doing all the talking. I didn't want to do that. But if it hadn't have been for you and your background and your creativity and your tremendous experience of writing, what, over 20 number one New York Times bestselling novels in the genre of fantasy fiction, if it hadn't have been for that, there's no way this book would have turned out the way it did. And then discovering that Erlin, your wife, uh, is an incredible editor, um, that was such a huge, huge bonus. And frankly, you know as well as I do, Brandon, that there is no way that this book could have become a success without Erlin and all of the time and effort she put into it. Yeah, it, it wouldn't have been it wouldn't have been as tight. I mean, you you guys you guys had pulled together some amazing research. You guys had pulled together. I mean, you had just talking with you and hearing the stories that you were kind of drawing from to tell the story that you're telling. Um, 
it made me interested. Um, you know, I, I'd never been, I had never been much of a believer in UFOs. I'd never been much of a believer. Like, but to, but to be fair, I hadn't really given it a serious thought either. You know, like I just, it just was kind of background noise. It just seemed, I, I love fantasy. And so I kind of lumped it with fantasy. I lumped it with, you know, sci-fi and imagination. And, but the more I, the more I heard some of your stories and the more I actually just have talked to some other people who, besides you, who all seem to flow into my life at the same time yeah. and really truly really unconnected with you, you know, almost like, a, well, it, it felt choreographed or. Yeah. Um, Things were coming together in a very odd way. Yeah. But, but, but it left me suddenly much more open and curious about the topic. And then your stories and, and some of the research you've done, really, uh, they just kind of made sense. And, and suddenly I was very interested. I, I, I don't normally help people with books. I just don't have time. Like when I say I don't normally, I've never done it before. I may never do it again. Like, like, like where I directly get involved and help a book. Um, but this one, it, it's been a really cool experience because your guys is, you know, you and Rick had pulled together such good research, had such an interesting story to tell, and the possibility that there is, that it's drawing from truth is what made me go, oh, this is kind of special. This is kind of different. I'll, 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 I'll help these guys. Yeah. You know, I had the opportunity to attend um, an event called Phenomicon, down in Bernal um, a couple months ago. And I gave a presentation, and in the presentation, I uh, introduced a gentleman, uh, a Stanford professor named John Krumboltz, who since passed away, but he was the professor of education and psychology at Stanford University. I think he was the department head, and he ended up writing tons of books, lecturing throughout the world and became one of the top authorities in, in the industry of psychology in the world. And uh, he, he passed away at the age of 90, but I had the opportunity to meet him years ago. And I found it interesting that uh, he was interviewed in a book called Their Finest Hour. It was a book written by psychologist about psychologist i know who who would read a book like that it, it's but somehow yeah. this psychologist book, I, I know this book fell into my lap and i'm kind of thumbing through it and i see john crumbles and i thought oh i remember him and i thought i wonder what his finest hour would be as a therapist a lecturer and everything else and I was totally blown away when I'm reading his chapter. The name of the chapter was Treating the Trauma of Alien Abduction. And he talked about having an encounter with a middle-aged man that he referred to as Bill. Um, I, I want to say it was around the, the, the early 90s uh, that he met this gentleman in San Jose who talked about all of these mostly horrendous experiences he had with alien encounters. And uh, so Bill became the main, the main, um, I'm, I'm looking for the right way to say it. The character Connor in the book is patterned very much after Bill and the experiences that he had. And when you talk yeah. about some of the truth and some of the wild experiences, they are true. They're experiences that came from this person named Bill, who spent two weeks in therapy, I believe, with Professor Crumbles. And for a Stanford professor to say at the near the end of his life, the most uh, the finest hour he had was spending two weeks with someone discussing their alien abduction is amazing. Uh, and quite brave, actually, for a, a professor, Stanford, or any, any university to actually say that. Well, so it, we, it shows it shows it made an impact on him, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it, it had this guy, whatever this, whatever Bill was sharing with him, this this Stanford professor gave it a lot of credence, and 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 that's that's one of one of many reasons why some of the sources you drew from are just interesting, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, when people will say, who is Connor? Um, I, I basically have to say Connor is a compilation of a lot of people. You know, I can say I'm Connor, you're Connor, you're Connor, she's Connor, he's Connor, because um, I think that the things we write about in the book uh, and not just alien stuff, but it's also spiritual stuff. We we talk right. about evil spirits. We talk about good spirits, angels that are around this little boy helping him deal with stuff. Um, so it, it's not just a book about aliens. Even though I'm on an alien ship at the moment, it's not just about aliens. <laughs> but what I want to talk about or have you talk about, at our book launch last March, uh, you gave a presentation, and you you came up with a concept that people are still talking about called the maybe table. Can you take a couple of minutes and explain what you mean by the maybe table and, and how that concept grew for you? Yeah, sure. Yeah, like that's it, – it, it's – having a maybe table is how I is how I make sense of the gray areas of life, Right. Um, for me, see, if, if there wasn't a spiritual component to return from Risa, I'm not sure I would have been as interested in the story, but, but part of what made the story so interesting was that it reconciled, um, Hey, there, there, there could be a God and angels and spirits that could all be true. And there could also be aliens, and, 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 and these things aren't mutually exclusive. It's not if one's true, the other's false. Yeah, it, it says, hey, this, this very well might be an and, not an or, right? Like with, with angels and aliens. Um, and, and perhaps if there's a god of this universe, the aliens, any aliens of this universe would probably know of this god and worship this god, or, or some of them might, or a, pr- a proportion of them might. And, um, all, all these things are part of the part of the story and so that's why it 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 came into contact with my maybe table because i use my maybe table as i seek out truth like spiritual truth what i think is true what i think is real and in my life i have had some experiences where i feel utterly convinced and satisfied that god is real and and you know that this is not something that the nature of God doesn't let me go prove that to someone else. But as I live my life, I'm trying to figure it out for myself. And for myself, I'm convinced for myself. I have had some experiences that, that leave me feeling sure that God is real, that he loves us, that he, that he takes care of us, you know, like, and, and and it doesn't answer all the questions. (laughs) I don't have all the answers to, to, to how he operates or who he is. Um, in, in, in all the, in all its details, but I do feel certain that he exists and that he loves us and that he sometimes intervenes to help us. Right. And so that would be something because of my experiences over the course of my life, I'm 48 right now. Um, that's on my yes table. If, if there's, if there's a place in my mind where I store what I think I know, there are certain things I say, yes, yes. I think there's a God. Yes. I think, you know, Jesus Christ was sent from God to, to be our savior. I, I think that's true. And so for me, that's on my yes table, right? Um, there might be some things on my no table, things that I, that life has made me feel like, yeah, I don't think that's true. I don't believe that. Um, and part of the beauty of, of the whole system in my head is that um, things can move from table to table, right? Right. If I learn, like I try to stay flexible. If something I thought was a yes is a no, okay, I'll move it. I don't want to pretend I know the truth. I want to actually know the truth. And that means as I discover new things, I reorder my thinking. Um, so in the pursuit of learning new things, uh, to me it's very valuable to have a place to put ideas that I'm just not sure about. Um, aliens is a really good example Aliens is a good example because initially I, I just I didn't give it any serious thought. I think it was just kind of a vague no for me, but not with any reason or not with any um, not not because I'd really given the matter any any serious thought. It just seemed well, yeah, it's probably made up. It's probably silly, and that that was all the thought I'd given it. The more I saw, well, maybe this is true. It may, you know, there's some people that I've talked to that have very sincere experience. I have never seen that I know of an alien or an alien spaceship 
you know, I, I just haven't had that experience in my life. And so, so far, I'm having to go off what other people say, whatever people, what other people share. And, and with that, it's like, well, where do I put this? What do I do with this? And the answer for me is I put it on my maybe table. Like, like, like I don't have to dismiss something out of hand just because I'm not sure one way or the other. But if, if somebody comes to me and presents a pretty good argument and maybe a pretty good personal witness, I've had a few people give me some firsthand accounts of, of seeing things that weren't just, just a blip in the sky that were pretty striking, right? Like, like that were that, that the people I was talking with seemed sure about what they were telling me. Um, and because these people seem sincere and because they seem so sure, it moved me to a place where I was like, well, maybe, you know, something I thought was a no, as I gave it more thought and attention, I started to go, I don't have a good reason why not, right? And so let's set it on the maybe table. Let's set it on the maybe table. And in my experience, let's say coming to know God was real. There was a time, rewind, when I was a teenager, I didn't know. I kind of hoped he was real, that the idea of him was comforting, the thought that there was someone that loved me and that this life had a purpose. And, you know, these things were, were comforting, nice thoughts. And and I, I didn't want to fool myself. I didn't want to kid myself. I didn't want God to be just Dumbo's magic feather, just like, you know, a placebo to help me get through life. You know, if I was going to really worship him, if I was really going to kind of devote myself to this concept, I wanted to know. And so for a while, without I hadn't even named a maybe table yet, but this idea of God was on my maybe table at a certain point, right? It was on a, a hopefully yes part of my maybe table. Like I wanted to believe it. And as it sat there over time, I had experiences that confirmed it. As I sought that truth, I had experiences that, that, that let me feel, yeah, this is right and real enough to move it to my yes table. Um, aliens right now, they sit on my maybe table. I, 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 I don't see any, any use in dismissing them unless I have a good reason to dismiss them. And, so, and, and because I've had some people give me good reason to think, well, maybe... And including, like, your book is one of those things. Some of the experiences in that book left me going, okay, I mean, this makes a weird kind of sense, like, enough that, yeah, I'll, I'll, give, it a, I'll give it at least a maybe and set it on that maybe. And here's the beautiful thing, at least in my life, about seeking truth. As I seek truth, if I say maybe and I kind of ask God about it and kind of keep my mind open to it, it'll either grow and expand or it won't. And if it grows and expands, hey, that could get moved to my yes table someday. And and if it, and if not much happens, it might just stay on my maybe table. Or if I have some experiences that really seem to say, no, this is wrong, yeah, you move to the no table. But the beautiful thing about a maybe table is just kind of naming it for me takes away some of the tension of not knowing. <laughs> you know, we, we tend to have binary thinking. We want to say yes or no. We want to make the judgment. And to me, it's a lot wiser when you don't know to just say maybe and, and wait and see and keep collecting data. I think I think it's awesome. I love the concept. I I loved it when you presented it at our book launch. Um, I've thought so much about it, and, and I've tried to do that in my own life because, yes, yeah, sometimes we want things to be black and white. We want a powerful yes or a definite no. And it doesn't always turn out that way. So I love the maybe table concept. Let me switch gears for a second. I, I want to talk about something you said that you just mentioned about the fact that there could be aliens on other worlds and they could possibly know who God is. Um, I, I firmly believe, and I, and I know that you do too, because I know that our religious beliefs are very similar. Um, I believe that God is the supreme creator of the universe, and I believe that he created worlds without number, and that he placed his children on those worlds. He didn't just create one earth and put a handful of us in a universe that has worlds without number. He, he sprinkled his children on earth-like planets, I believe, throughout the universe. And I believe that he gave each of them the same path to return to him that he gave us, the same plan, the same path. And part of that, I believe, was um, was um, 
a savior, Jesus Christ, who I refer to as the savior of the universe. And I believe that beings on other worlds who who know and understand God and, and have a belief in the same God that perhaps you and I do, that they also have the same belief and understanding in who the Savior is. He might be known by different names, different different uh, dialects or languages, of course, but they know who he is, and they know he's the Savior of the universe. So one of the most intriguing things to me, uh, and one of the reasons I've, I've been so excited about this book and the series Return from Risa, is that it really is going that direction. It's it's looking at those ideas and concepts. And if, in fact, people, beings on another world, we talk about aliens and look, they could look just like you and me, Brandon. But if they're coming from another world, they are an alien, right? Yes. It, it doesn't mean that they are disfigured and look horribly different than we do. They're an alien because they're not from here. But I've often thought if you lived on another planet, and you believed in the same gospel that we do, and you knew where the Savior of the universe was born, where he lived his life, where he uh, created the, uh, he brought the good news, the gospel, where he atoned for our sins, was crucified and resurrected. If you knew all of that and you knew where this planet was, and then if you had the wherewithal, to go visit that planet, wouldn't you do it? Yes. In a heartbeat. Would. In a heartbeat. So I do believe that there are other beings from other worlds that are probably just like you and me who come here kind of, I don't know if a pilgrimage is the right word, but maybe it is, who, who come here to see where Jesus walked. They come here because they want to see where their Savior was born, raised, and, and gave them this incredible opportunity to return home to the God who created them. So I firmly believe that. And, and I believe that, you know, there are there are civilizations much older than ours and much, much more advanced than ours and that have access to the type of technology to allow them to come here. And I believe that's one of the reasons so many different sightings have been talked about for thousands of years in our in our world beings coming here i think that's one of the main reasons they come here what are what are your thoughts i mean yeah. I, I i'm on the same page as you on I, I believe in god and therefore i believe that his works would be many right so like like i i never had a doubt like for me once i knew god was real it was a it was an assumption that followed that he created as many worlds as he wanted to create that the that the universe is expansive and full of stars and energy and light for a reason that that's probably powering some other worlds right um and so so that that I never really doubted what what I would have doubted was that they came here that they had access to us you know like i could I could easily picture that God might create this and partition it out right like hey you you stay in your solar system. You stay in your solar system. Play in system. your own sandbox. Yeah, play in your own sandbox. It, it was it was easy to imagine that. But but as I really open up my mind to the idea, I find it equally easy to imagine that yeah, some of those civilizations might be more advanced and might be able to to visit other sandboxes, visit other solar systems, and and, and that there could be rules that apply, and that it, the universe could look a little more like Star Trek. And, and a little less like, you know, a bunch of uh, vast reaches of empty space and, you know, a few disconnected, isolated settlements here and there. Um, I, I, I think it would be strange, as I use my imagination, to be taught like, hey, you, you've got this Heavenly Father who loves you, and the Savior will be born on a different world. And and he will and he will atone for your sins. And and I assume if that happened, he probably in different ways visited these other worlds too. But 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 that his mortality and his crucifixion would be on this other world that that you've heard of. Yeah, if, if I had been taught that, I'd be very interested in visiting that other world, yeah. much like people 
in our world want to go visit Jerusalem or go visit Mecca sure. or go visit sites yeah. they consider holy. It just makes lots of sense to me. Yeah. And, you know, you talk about other world. I, I've had the discussion with people that, yeah, it might seem odd that your Savior was born on another world, and that's where he lived his life, and everything he did for you took place on another world. But you know what? He was also born on the other side of the world I live on. Right. right. He was born really in another world that I'm familiar with, than I'm than what I'm familiar with. So sure. to me, the distance is not the issue. You know, whether he's born on the other side of this world or another world somewhere else, that's really not the issue. And I would think that those who know who he is and understand that uh, would accept that. They'd be fine with that. That he was born somewhere else, but his actions still impact them. So. I I think for somebody who believes in God, if you pause and consider the possibility that he made other worlds and populated other worlds, and, 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 and you know, this isn't just this unique thing, this world, um, some of the conclusions that get drawn in Return from Risa seem very plausible, almost logical, right? Like that they would parallel how God dealt with different nations in our world who, you know, a couple centuries ago, we're totally unconnected as if they were on foreign planets, right? Like we didn't, the, the technology has made our world small, but it yeah. used to be vast. It used to be three months to send a letter. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it used to be, it used to be, you know, six months to get across the world. Now we can do it in a day. That changes yeah. everything. But, it is amazing. But, but, but back in the day, these are very separate civilizations in a lot of ways, right? Yeah. Well, that kind of, takes me to, to one last thing I want to talk about. You had mentioned that um, a lot of different people have kind of come into your life and come together. And and I feel the same way. And I know I speak for my co-author, Rick Nelson, when I say that he does too. Um, one of the other amazing people that came into our life, and I believe you may have met him because of this book, is Michael Rush. Correct? Yeah, very interesting guy. You know, so, and and... And of course, this will be aired on Thursday the 1st, and Michael will be live with us on the 2nd. So one of the things that was amazing about meeting Michael Rush is obviously his books, and I know you've read his books as well, uh, A Remnant Shall Return, Daniel 11, um, Revelation, The Vision of John of the Divine, and Delight and Plainness. I think I got all four of them. Um, That's right. One of the wonderful things about getting to know Michael Rush uh, was his belief through his study of the scriptures that the lost 10 tribes were taken off the earth. And we talk about that in Return from Risa. What are your thoughts on that? Had, had you had you heard that before we started sharing the book with you or I, I'm just not sure when, or what are your thoughts on the possibility? Yeah, so I mean, gosh, that was sort of the concept of the old Battlestar Galactica. I mean, like, like, like so, 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 so people have imagined this before. This isn't the first time anyone thought, hey, that would be interesting if they'd been yeah. moved somewhere else. People have, have done this in fiction, but what's kind of interesting about Michael Rush is see when, when the guys were first trying to get me interested in you, some of our mutual friends, they, they, they had me look at some Michael Rush. And the reason they had me look at Michael Rush is Michael Rush makes a pretty strong scriptural argument using the Bible, using scripture to say, hey, like based on my reading of these scriptures, if you think it through, there's a case to be made that maybe some of some of these miracles and wonders in the last days, you know, that we see in the book of Revelation and in the book of Daniel and in other places in, in the Bible. Um, maybe some of these things are indicating some of these signs and wonders come from off world and are, are, are people returning to this world and, you know, they, they might have been taken away. And he makes a good enough case that reading his stuff alone put the put the alien thing onto my maybe table. Whereas like, hey, I believe in God and he, and here he's using scripture to to, to make a, a pretty sound argument for the possibility that this is real. I mean it takes some time to read his stuff. Yeah. And and, 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 and it's a very thorough argument, which means you know it's kind of dense, it's kind of heavy reading. 
but 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 I plowed through and yeah the argument was pretty strong I mean it's not you know nothing's going to be perfect or airtight but it was a strong argument and you know and, and he pulled out some really some really um some convincing scriptures so yeah I mean he's an interesting guy if, if you wanted to talk hey does the bible leave room for this stuff to be real you know does the bible leave room for maybe maybe off world people coming to earth or maybe even that those lost tribes could be coming to earth I mean, all those concepts are now on firmly on my maybe table because he made a strong case for it, and and if it plays out that way, I I will no longer be shocked, you know. Whereas maybe five years ago, I I might have thought it was pure Battlestar Galactica fiction, you know, to think of something like that maybe being true. But but now, hey, if if, <laughs> if Lost Tribes return from space, I'd be like, hey, some people have called that possibility. <laughs> I, I will be much less shocked than I would have been. You know, I was thinking about what you said near the beginning. You know, here here you have written, how many books have you written? I mean, how many different series have you written? Yeah, I made like five different series, uh, about 20 different novels. Yeah, all, all of these books, fantasy adventure, novels. fantasy, adventure, fantasy fiction, you create all of this stuff. And I'm kind of thinking to myself, you have one of the most brilliant minds of imagination of creating worlds and characters and all of this stuff. And I kind of laugh. I'm thinking, but hmm, is it possible there could even be aliens on other planets? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, it's just all from your head going into a book, but suddenly it's like, oh my gosh, is it possible that there could be beings on other worlds? I just think it's interesting. Uh, from the standpoint of all of the books you've written about you're creating all of these worlds and characters and people and places um, that it hadn't really set in that, wait a minute. Um, yeah, there could be people on other worlds. So I think it's really cool. Again, going back to your maybe table. So I, I want to ask you something else. So you wrote the, Oh, I love how this disappears. You yeah. Wrote the, See, it's technology. That rice and technology is making it disappear. Anyway, you wrote... It's, it's like it's wearing a Frodo's cloak of invisible yeah. beers. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Or there's another character in, in, in Return from Rice that could be him, the spy. It, he's doing it, remember? Yeah, who can shield himself, hide himself. Yeah. That's right. So you wrote the back cover, and one of the things you wrote at the very end is you said... Too intense for kids, this fascinating story blends spirituality and alien encounters in a way I have never seen before. Now, I appreciate that you put that on there because your readers know you as an author who writes books in a, in a, a genre that are very much appropriate for kids. Kind of, kind of family friendly. Is, is very family friendly. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit more about what you meant when you said, sorry, too intense for kids? Yeah, like, like uh, I've got a spectrum of readers. And because I was, I was kind of endorsing this book or talking about what this book was, I didn't want my most sensitive little guy who might read my books. There's some intense stuff in, 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 in the book. There is. And it's, it's not that the book feels like an R-rated movie. But, but it is that the book has some intense moments of real duress and real conflict, which is cool, but it's a little more adult than I would go in my stuff, sure. right? Some of the scary things that, I mean, because alien abductions are sometimes fraught with, and it, it's right there present in Risa, that people are put in incredibly perilous situations. And some of these people went through... Um, things that I would describe as nightmarish or horrific, right? Like like there are moments in Return from Risa where it feels like you're reading a horror novel with some of this really scary things that are done to some people by these aliens. And so I, I didn't want to shock my most sensitive readers. Sure. That, 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 that's why I said that. Like, um, And, and I, I would stand by it because there are some really intense things. Now, if you're the kind of kid that, that doesn't mind intense stuff, I that kind of kid, you'd probably be just fine with this book. But 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 if you were a sensitive young kid, you know, I could picture they, they could run into some stuff where they'd be like, wow, that, that is truly horrifying. You know what I mean? Because poor Connor, I mean, some, Connor's a young main character. You know, I write young main characters, but some of the stuff Connor had to see and go through, I've never written something that intense. Cause, cause, but, but the whole thing, the whole point is that some of, this, some of these reports 
are, um, you know, are, are based on people's actual accounts. And so would be doing a disservice, you know, not to mention some of these gory details or intense details, you know, more or less in RISA, we find, you know, in return from RISA, there are aliens that are benevolent and, and, and are friendly to our planet and our people. And there are aliens that are just vicious, <laughs> like, like truly evil and, 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 and really do some, some, some horrific things. And so because of some of the horrific things, hey, it's part of what makes it a good story too. But, but some of those horrific things that might be a little much for the most sensitive readers maybe. Yeah, no, and I, I appreciate that. It, it's, it's always a challenge when someone will ask me who, what is the age appropriate of this book? And you gave a great explanation, and I just don't know how to answer that. I think it really depends on the individual. I look at some of the things that that parents let their kids watch on television or the movies they go to. You know, I I've always I was always a Marvel a comics fan growing up, but I'm telling you, some of the stuff in the Marvel comics movies are pretty intense. And Especially Doctor Strange Part Two. That was like crazy. That oh, was yeah. basically a horror. It was basically a horror movie. And you've got but, young kids watching that. And Phil, I, I would say, I would say with Risa, if your kids watch PG thirteen movies, that's the ballpark. Like I would say, that's in the neighborhood, right? Like, yeah. I mean, I, I, there's some moments that are PG thirteen. There's some moments that if explicitly depicted might feel rated at R, but 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 the book doesn't. Um, yeah, we try to be very careful. It. And thanks to yeah. Erlin's wonderful editing, I think that we were we did a really good job of uh, of not making certain scenes too graphic. Um, if I was trying to use movie lingo, I'd say most of the book is PG, and there are some moments that are that are that feel PG thirteen, and and if they had been ex- ex- if they had been explained in all the gory detail, it would feel R rated. You know what I mean? It'd feel like this is just for adults. But, yeah. but I, I think for the most part, you kind of kept it in the PG-13 realm. So the kind of kid that could watch, uh, you know, some intense PG movie scenes, I think that kind of kid, you know, w- would would have a good time in Rice and probably like some of the excitement and danger of, of some of those scenes. Yeah. Awesome. Brandon, thank you so much. I'm sure that uh, if this was live, there'd be all kinds of questions coming in. And I'm sure that people who will be watching this will say, Phil, you should have asked him this or you should have asked him that. So I apologize to anybody who's watching it for the questions I did not ask. But I do want to ask you a couple more. So you sure. just finished the final book in the Candy Shop Wars, right? Yeah, so I, I have Is that a, book uh, out because I've had people asking me about it. Is it out? No, it's not out yet. So there, there are two Candy Shop War books. I never Candy Shop War is you're in a normal neighborhood, normal kids, but magicians come to town and they're sharing magical candy. To get the magical candy, the kids have to do tasks for these magicians, and it leads to all sorts of trouble. You know, some of these magicians have shady purposes. Um, but Candy Shop War, when I wrote the first book, I wasn't planning on it being a series. I wrote it back in like 2007, 2008. It's been a while. But there were a group of my readers where it was their favorite one. So maybe six or seven years later, I wrote a sequel. Again, they wanted more. And I'm, so I'm finally finishing this series. In, in the coming March, the third and final Candy Shop War book will come out. It's called The Carnival Quest. Um, I'm excited about it. I know there's, there's a lot of readers that have been waiting for it, and hopefully we'll get a whole new wave of readers that will have fun now that we've got kind of a complete series with these three books. Yeah, that, that is really cool. Yeah, I just had someone like two days ago saying, I went online to get it, but it's not available. Because yeah, I not just, yet. March. March. Okay, cool. And and what have you got it's planned? Written. It's done. It's cool, I promise. Well, I know like, you've finished it's not it. It's good, but, but we're just waiting for uh, – you know, it, it's you, you're waiting for it to get printed up, shipped out. You know the practicalities. So in, in March, it'll be available for for a general audience. That's cool. And I know you're working on a top secret brand new project. You probably can't tell us much about, but a brand new series. Yeah, I know, I, I, I know your fans will be excited to hear that. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's how I pay the bills. It's how I stay employed. So I, I'm always working on working on something, and it's also my favorite thing to do. My my favorite hobby became my job. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a guy who, um, if, if you gave me a billion bucks, I'd still be living pretty much the same life. I, I, I really enjoy writing stories. And so um, 
I, I'm excited. I've got a new series that is something brand new. No one's seen it before. Sometimes people want me to add on or do new stuff for the old series. And I, I like doing that. I've been doing that lately. Dragon Watch was my sequel series to Fable Haven and Candy Shop World was finishing out a previously made series. And I'm working on something brand new, probably three books. It's being pitched right now to major publishers. And once I, once we get the pitch, I'll I, like, basically once we have a book deal, then I'll, I'll, I'll know the book's happening. Cause I don't, I don't write a big new series unless somebody's investing in it. Um, Cause otherwise oh, I'm it, sure it'll it, happen. I'd be out on a limb, but it looks like it's going to happen. looks like it's going to be good, but I'll, I'll say more once I officially know. Yeah, I, I'm sure it'll happen. And, and I know there are a lot of people that will be excited about it. All right. As we wrap this up again, I, I can't thank you enough for the help that you and Erlan provided for the book. Um, more importantly, I, I love you both. And I'm so grateful for your friendship that you've come into my life. And again, I know I'm speaking for Rick Nelson when I say that. Frankly, I'm speaking for our wives, Sean and Susie, um, who've also had the opportunity to, on many occasions to spend time with the two of you. Um, so as we wrap this up, what would you say, um, why, what would you say to a person who wasn't sure about whether or not they would want to read or be interested in the book Return from Risa? Yeah, what would I say? Um, I mean, th this is something I have conversations. I've recommended this book to some friends. I've said, hey, this is a, an interesting take on what aliens might actually look like if, you know, if, if, if God is real. And, you know, if you take that as, as your premise, which I believe is true, um, you know, if God is real and we incorporate that into the story, we make that part of the narrative, um, what would what would it look like if, if God is real and aliens are real? You know, and, and how could that all combine and almost be, be a part of what describes actual reality if we include all the spiritual and we include everything, all the crazy stuff that might be out there? Um, it takes a really great stab at trying to paint the picture of what that might look like. And if that seemed interesting to somebody, I mean, yeah, if nothing else, it expands your mind. Here's the thing about me. You know, I think a lot of people might go, okay, Brandon Mull writes lots of fantasy, so his brain lives in Never Never Land and Narnia, <laughs> and they wouldn't be wrong. Right? And then they'd be like, oh, he, he thinks aliens might be real? Uh, well, wasn't he just writing about trolls and centaurs? <laughs> you know? And, right. and, and, and it'd be right, but but I also would make this argument. See, because I live and because I venture into the realms of fantasy so often, and I also have to live a normal life and be a dad and make a living, you know, so, so I'm, in some ways I'm very much a grown-up who lives in the real world and, and pays his bills and pays his taxes and, and, and tries to take care of his kids and his family. And, and I also live in Never Never Land. And I would say I cross the border between reality and make-believe so frequently that I'm very familiar with it. I kind of know where the border lies. Yeah, you can tell the difference. Me, True. To me, I like that. To, to, to me, it's not mysterious. To me, it's a thing I cross all the time. And I'm, I'm pretty sure there's certain things to me that are sacred and important and true. And, and, and there's also things that I think are just fun and make-believe. And with that understanding, some of the ideas that are in Return from Risa about the possibility of aliens visiting our world, that is squarely on my maybe table. Like, like, like I kind of said at the start, like, like I am not sure that that stuff is all made up. I, I kind of suspect it's not. And hey, if I'm wrong, I'll, I'll I'll roll with it and figure it out. But 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 my antenna is up on that stuff. And, and and if it's something that might be, if that concept seems interesting, um, what we do with fiction is we try to we create a story that might not be a true story. Like when I write Fable Haven, Fable Haven, as far as I know, doesn't exist. I made it up, right? I made it really? up a character. I yeah, thought it yeah, was yeah. true. Yeah, well, you know, but my job is to make it feel true. And my job is go. to believe it as much as I can so that it comes yeah. across as yeah. feeling plausible and true, even though it's made up, right? Stephen King has this great quote where he says, fiction is the truth inside the lie, hmm. right? And so sometimes we can create a scenario and tell a story that might have some fiction in it or might be fiction, and we can still say true things, with that fiction. Hmm. And I think that Return from Risa 
is attempting to do that. It, it is telling us a story, and it's within that story, trying to say some true things, trying to say some principles that might be real, and 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 painting a painting a picture for us in a with maybe some fictional scenarios or maybe partly fictional scenarios that are you know based on accounts. Um, but but what you get if you read Return from Risa is you get a story that says. Okay, here's here's a, a story you can read that's make believe, and hey, read it with your antenna up and see if there might be some truth in here. We'll see if there might be some principles that resonate. And if you read it like that, I, I think to me there's a lot of value in it. If I didn't think there was value in it, I promise I wouldn't have helped you <laughs> because it, it, it didn't make it didn't make any sense except for that the subject matter seemed really interesting to me, and also like you said, you've become a good friend. I really like you, and, and that that's a reason too, you know, like, like, like I like you and I love you and, and, and Rick and your wives. And, um, but even with all that, if it hadn't have felt really interesting to me, I, 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 my, I have insane demands on my time. And for some reason, this thing mattered enough that, that I lent it some time and gave it some attention. And my wife gave it massive attention. I mean, I, I mean, her Lynn, devoted you know like like a good part of a year to to, to try to help whip that thing into shape um hey that was done for a reason that was done because we, we thought there was some value there we thought maybe feels like there might be some true principles inside this story thanks brandon you are awesome please give my love to erlin sorry that uh she couldn't be with us tonight but thank you so much for all you've done in helping us with this project and and congratulations on finishing uh, or getting to the point where you finished all your books and now you're getting ready to start a new one. I'm, I'm really excited to find out one day what this new series is going to be about. Yeah, it, it, I don't think it'll be too long. In, in a few months, I'll, I'll make an announcement that'll, that'll let people know a little bit more what to expect. So it, it's always really nice to talk to you. You're, you're, you're a great guy, interesting brain. Um, talented writer, and 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 you've you, you're, you're sharing stories that at least have made me think and wonder, and, and have been fun to me. So thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Well, thank you, everybody. I'm going to say goodbye to Brandon, and Brandon is saying goodbye to you. And uh, Brandon, look forward to seeing you again soon. Yep, sounds good. Take care.